much energy. Put in your booby rocks. Live your best life. Keep doing you. Thanks, Jen. Also, I've been pre-approved for a diner's club card. Oh, good. How is your extended warranty? Not too bad. Okay, good. Still extended? It is. They keep calling to ask me, though. Yeah. Uh, All right, and we have a new buddy here. He is... uh, I'm just so excited for him. I was cracking up at his registration form. We are going to have a great time. We are going to welcome to our podcast right now, Mike... I am Ellie. Yeah, thank you for having me. I you made it, Mike. Yeah. He's in Boston. I am. Yes, good times, good times. So, Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll just kind of riff, raff, riff, raff. Yeah, let's do there. it. So, I guess the first thing to know about me is I'm aligned, zany, free, unmistakable, successful, and vulnerable. Yeah. And I, I, I say that, right, because... You know, I think for a lot of my life, I used to lead with like, here's a title or here's like my relationship or here's something about me. And my story basically is I have just been spending my life unpacking from all that stuff and realizing like I'm not just one thing. I'm not fitting in the box in every place I show up. I'm zany and aligned. I have, you know, been all over the place. I started the PR agency when I was 22, working with some celebrities I um, vomited blood every day for months and had this life-threatening illness. I fell in love with my caretaker who was a man and did not at that point ever been in a same-sex relationship. Um, I wrote about it and it went viral. You know, millions of people talking about my sex life. There's been a lot of crazy things in my journey. Wow. That is super crazy. What's Okay. So where do we even start, right? Like even to unpack all of that, where do we go? (laughs) Yeah. So I I can tell you my story. It's an interesting one. So, you know, basically I started out um, at 22. I was pretty successful. I, with a bunch of executives, we started a PR agency and we worked with a lot of politicians and tech billionaires and celebrities. And it was really cool. But then a few years later, I woke up and I was vomiting blood, just randomly vomiting blood. Not a good look every day for months. It was terrifying. I was in and out of the emergency room. And, you know, it got so bad that one day I was at work and I had to go to the bathroom and I ran to the bathroom and I did not make it. And I shit my pants at work. So this Uh, was, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is called Tuesday and my (laughs) book. Right, exactly. Yes, yes. No, this was mortifying. So I knew like something was really wrong with me and I thought I was going to die. And in the midst of this, I was trying everything to get better. Like I was doing all types of crazy stuff. I read that people wrote handwritten letters to their family saying everything they've never said out loud to them. And so I did that. I sent every member of my family a handwritten letter of anything I never said to them. Oh gosh. Cause you thought this was it. Like, yeah. And I, and I was like, I I just gotta like, gonna go clear it out, get, you know, everything out so that I can heal. And so in the midst of this, I was so sick that one of my roommates who was a guy I knew from college, he was a medical professional. And he started taking care of me, you know, at first just driving me to appointments. Eventually he would, you know, have to cook dinner because I couldn't get off the couch. And a few months into this, I realized, I think I have feelings for him. And they didn't feel sexual. They didn't feel even romantic, but it felt like, hey, something is going on here. And I had, at least to my conscious knowledge, been straight. So I thought like, I I don't know, is this like, I'm going to die tomorrow. And this is just a person in my vicinity. And hey, why not? And so I, um, I probably would have brushed it under the rug, but here I was thinking, I'm probably going to die. And so I just said, hey, I don't know if you're going to punch me in the face. I don't know how you're going to react, but like, I feel something here. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and that started a few months of conversation that led to two years of us exploring if a relationship could work. So we dated women. We explored that, you know, privately. And I mean, today we've been married for years. So yeah. we are together. Well, congratulations. That's- Thank you. Thank and, you. Yeah. So awesome that you gave each other that space to kind yeah. of figure it out, you know, to yeah. say like, is this really supposed to work? And let's see if, if it shouldn't, or it should be something else. Yeah, exactly. And so while that's going on, I decided I can't stay at a job where I'm vomiting blood. And so I probably need to leave my job, right? Right. And so I gave a year's notice at work. Now, for anyone listening, I never recommend you do that. But, you know, this was, I was an owner. I felt like that's the responsible thing to do. Yeah. And I figured I'm just going to figure something out. So like I went to herbal school. I went to nutrition school that year. You know, here I am going to two schools full time. I worked full time. I'm healing myself and I'm navigating my first same sex relationship. It was hellish. But the year ended, I survived it. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to be like this herbalist to Boston's entrepreneurs, because why not? You know, I, these people are getting sick. I was sick. I can help these people out. Yeah. And I didn't love it. I didn't love it at all. So I thought, you know what, like you didn't leave your job for nothing, Mike. I've got all these stories. Now I wasn't ready to talk about my relationship yet, but I was really successful at a young age. I got sick. It wasn't what I was cracked up to be. I thought I can talk about this, right? Sure. So I started a blog and it got pretty popular. And three months later, someone reached out to me and said, Hey, Mike, I'm a publisher. I love your voice. Can I just give you a book deal? And I was like, does that happen to people? Right? Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Give me a book deal. I'll write a book. You pay me. That's cool. And in the book, they really wanted me to talk about my relationship. And I thought, okay, that's fine. And I turned to the manuscript and then I thought, oh shit. Like, I haven't even told people in my life. They can't find out on the shelves of Barnes and Noble about my relationship. You know, like I have to tell people about this. So I thought, all right, all right. So my family knew, a few close friends knew, but not a lot of people knew. And so I decided. Quick question real quick in that. So when you were telling your family, was anybody shocked? Or- yes. So yes. Okay. So uh, so many layers to this. Okay. So first of all, the, yes, there definitely, you know, some people were shocked. And, you know, at the time, it was really interesting. People always say to me like, oh, you fell in love. So when you kissed Garrett for the first time, that's my husband's name. When you kissed him, did it feel so natural? I was like, no, I've never felt facial hair while kissing somebody before. That felt the opposite of natural. And so, you know, when I told these people, you know, some reacted positively some not so much I won't name names today but everyone got there but my dad my dad actually had the best reaction he said okay so you're leaving your job and you found yourself a rich boyfriend you are so smart and that was his (laughs) reaction to me telling him about this so so people got there you know okay awesome and so so here I am thinking all right I'm just gonna blog about this experience and so I wrote an article about how yes Garrett's a man but I'm in love with him for a thousand reasons and being a man is one aspect of him And in any moment, I just have to choose am I moving towards or away from love? And that's Mm -hmm. all I did. So I wrote this piece, went to bed that night. I woke up the next morning and 100,000 people had shared it. And it was incredibly overwhelming to have millions of people talking about your sex life, um, to have like NPR and Yahoo News and Huffington Post calling me about my sex life and wanting to talk about these things. And I'm still figuring it out, right? People ask me to defend this. I'm like, I don't know. Like, I'm just figuring, I'm not this like poster child for this entire movement. I have no right. idea what's going on. Yeah. So it was a pretty overwhelming moment. Sure. So, so there yeah. I am, you know, I've got this book deal. I've got this viral article. Millions of people are talking about me and I'm making no money. I don't have a business model. I don't like, I gave up herbalism. I gave up PR. I've got no idea what I'm doing with my life. All these people are watching me publicly fail. And I just think I am such a mess. And so I decided, you know what? I'm going to make my life purpose my obsession. And I have read literally every book out there about life purpose. I have done every training. I can tell you right now, I have heard so many times in my life, you will know your purpose by the end of these 60 minutes. Almost never happens. But I have heard that many, (laughs) many times in my life. And I said, okay. And when you read enough of this stuff, like it all says the same things, right? It's kind of like, you know, figure out your passions, figure out your skills, figure out what the world needs and find that middle point. Yeah. Okay. So how do these things connect? You probably just save people thousands and thousands. Yeah, there it is. There's my thousand dollar, you know, that's the (laughs) advice. That's what you came for today. 
No, so I'm sitting there thinking like, all right, how do these things even relate? We've got branding and PR, we've got herbalism, vomiting blood, same sex relationship, book deal, blogging, you know, viral article. What does anything have to do with one another? Right. And I thought, oh my gosh, I finally figured it out. This is so obvious. I meant to create a blogging course. And this blogging course is, yeah, it's going to help people get a book deal, but it's going to be deep and spiritual. It's going to be about finding your inner voice and knowing who you are. And this is it. And now at this point in my life, you know, I had no money because here I am the end of this year. Like I have gone broke living off my savings, sure. but I thought, screw it. I know my purpose. These things are telling me to go pro. I am going pro. So I get the fancy lighting kit and the microphone. You know, I got my business partner, my Facebook ads, my web designer, you name it. I put thousands into this thing. So I was like, this is taking off. Right. Put this thing out into the world. And I think five people bought it. It was a colossal failure. I lost thousands of dollars and I just thought I am done. I am so freaking done. Uh, you know, I, I felt like I went for it. Like I went for love. I went for, you know, I got the book deal. I left my job. Like I actually did things. It wasn't like I just sat back. Right. And the world is telling me it doesn't want what I have to offer. Yeah. And I was so devastated that I thought, you know what? I'm going to go back to my partner's and beg them to give me my job back. I don't have a, I don't know if I have a job in my own company, but beg them to give me a job in my own company. And that I was, that'll break your heart. Just feel like you're in the right space. Yeah. Like I was just, it was miserable, right? It was like so miserable, but I thought, right. you know what, Mike, oh let me host a failure celebration. And my thinking here was like, I'm just going to celebrate the fact that I did something that at least, you know, warranted failure. At least I took a risk. At least I did right. something. Okay. So I thought, all right, what am I still confident at? Because it wasn't much. And I thought, well, you know, branding and public relations, at least I've always been good at that. I started a company doing that. Let me use this. And so I went into a Facebook group I was a part of. And I said, let me just offer as many free branding sessions as I can do in a day, like totally free. I'm not successful. Maybe you guys can be. I'm just giving the stuff away. And so this was work I've done, you know, over the years. And I did a bunch of this work that day. I did nine hours. I literally stopped sessions to pee, but I didn't care. This was, this was my last right. day of work, so I had to give it. And I'm used to working with, you know, like I said, some celebrities or tech billionaires, but these people were like artists and comedians and psychics and healers and all types of cool people. Yeah. And so we did these sessions and every one of them said some variation to me of, Mike, you didn't tell me my brand. This is my whole life purpose. Like it answers my questions. So I'm sitting there like, what the, f what are you smoking? Like, is something wrong with you? I don't understand what's happening right now. You know, this is just simple branding. And so I thought, all right, let me, I guess I'll try this on myself. What do I have to lose? So after nine hours of work, I spent another two hours on myself doing this work. And I came out with six words. And those words are aligned, zany, free, unmistakable, successful, and vulnerable. And there was just this light bulb moment. It was like, oh my gosh, with Garrett, I've never been so safe to be vulnerable or zany and weird. And over here, when I wasn't successful, it was because I couldn't be these things. And over here, and it just felt like things started connecting. Like when I feel these, I'm successful and fulfilled. When I don't, I'm not. Mm -hmm. So it's like, all right. So kind of sitting with this and I checked my email and one of the women I worked with that day emailed me and said, hey, Mike, my friend wants to buy this thing. Like, do you sell it? What do you call this? I, was, I don't know. Like, it's not a thing. It it's just a free. It yes, was, I don't know. So I said, <laughs> it, it's branding, but you're telling me it's life purpose. I guess it's sacred. I'll call it sacred branding. Slap that name on. Didn't think much about it. So the next day somebody hired me. I made my first, I think I made like $200 or 250. It wasn't very much Ooh. money. Did this. Yeah. But I was like, all right, I'm making yeah. something here. <laughs> so I do this work with this one person. And the next day I had two more clients. And three weeks later, I had 30 clients. And that was seven years ago. I never ended up going back to public relations. And so this work has obviously changed and grown a lot over the years. And right. we've worked with everybody from porn stars and sex workers to, you know, drag queens on TV, comedians doing, you know, Netflix specials. I mean, uh, entrepreneurs, psychics, like you name it. But what's really cool is what we started to realize is we can actually map people's experiences. And, you know, this formula for what we naturally do when we're successful and fulfilled, what we kind of subconsciously do, each of us. And there's something really interesting, why our partner loves us, why you know, our audience thinks we're so magnetic is the same thing over and over again. So that's mm. how I ended up here today. That's amazing. Jeff Jones actually had an opportunity to work with porn stars. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Pro Jones sex ago. work. Absolutely. <laughs> no, I missed that boat there, Mike. I missed wow. that. Yeah. It was a missed 
opportunity. We had a we had a conversation about missed opportunities, and he shared that that he could yeah, have bummer. taken that route. That's what I'm. That's what I'm living with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I got it. <laughs> Married and had kids, but he could have been a, a porn film star. In in another life, another life. Yeah. I would have been the star. I just would have edited well, it. Yeah. Okay. Porn editor. editor. Yeah. <laughs> all right. That's a, a sweet job. I thought so. Yeah. That's a good times. Dang, I feel like I should have put some facial hair on for this episode. Like I didn't get, get a mustache. <laughs> your sweet your 70s mus- mustache right there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that's amazing. So after you worked with your clients and started working with your clients and then implemented that, did you, was your company called Sacred Branding? Yeah. So uh, my company is just Mike IML LLC. Um, But, you know, sacred branding is kind of the main process that we work with. And, you know, it's about two and a half hours. So it's a lengthy process. But how I work with people one on one and we have like courses and stuff like that. Yeah, that's amazing. When you first did you did it almost feel like that much easier instead of like a forced (laughs) success? You know, like I'm just trying so hard to be successful. Yeah. You know, I think that what I realized is why I was so successful in public relations is I was doing this formula without even knowing it. And when I wrote my book, the big irony of this book, which I had written before Sacred Branding, is it's all about, you know, defining success for yourself and figuring out this formula of what you naturally do when you're successful. So it's the, you know, my kind of big message to the world is we're already doing the thing that makes us successful. And in our best friendships or relationships, we're doing it. We just don't realize it's the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah. And I think people think because it's easy that that's not success. Exactly. and people get programmed that success needs to be hard. Right. And it's got to be all this hard work. Yeah. I always say you never have to try to be yourself. If you're trying, yeah. it means you're being somebody else. Like when we're having coffee with a best friend and hours fly by and genius spills out and we forget to try, that's what I want. I want business to be that. I want interviews to be right. that. I want my relationships to be that. And we can. So we've just got to kind of pull out any th- belief we have that like we've got to try and be somebody else to be successful. Yeah. And especially with the word aligned, it's so interesting where people just fight that alignment. And Mm -hmm. every time I hear the word aligned, I always think of almost like a river. Like you just have to jump into the river and literally just float with it. Yeah. 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 Right. Instead of trying to be like the salmon and fighting it. Mm -hmm, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. they're just doing that, but you know, (laughs) instead of like, don't make it so hard. Like, exactly. And I, it's funny because I have a lot of feedback that comes to me that everybody's like, oh, your life is so easy. And the thing is, like, it's all about alignment, yes. you know, living in what you're here to do yes. instead of fighting it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, too, a lot of people are just, you know, especially not even with the pandemic, even before the pandemic, you know, they just weren't happy with themselves in the yeah. job, in their yeah. life. And I'm, I'm hoping that they took the pandemic time to even figure that out, you know, right, and if right. they didn't now is the best time as sure. any. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So when you had your PR company um, and you worked with celebrities and famous people, did you find that as they, because you have to have a sense of, of vulnerability that mm-hmm. they have to have with you, did mm-hmm. you find it interesting to where you were thinking like, oh gosh, I have this famous person and you don't have to say names. I'm just saying like, yeah. as a, as having them sit in front of you or you're on the phone with them or wherever the conversation is, did you find that it was it almost mind blowing to see how somebody was off the camera or out of the spotlight? Yeah, you know, it's something I still face, you know, working with public people now, because I even sacred branding, we do a lot of vulnerable work. It's amazing because part of my job is to hold incredible vulnerability really quickly. Like I've got to get people to open up about everything quickly because I only have two and a half hours to know every major point of their life and be able to map it. And so it's really incredible to see how all of us are insecure, right? All of us have the same challenges. And in fact, anybody who feels like they're building a life that isn't 100% aligned or isn't 100% um, you know, in who they are, it actually, the more successful you get, the less confident you become. And I know that seems con- counterintuitive, but here's the thing. If I'm like, you know, I've got to put on this bubbly personality to be successful, the more I get validated for that and it's not authentic to me, the more I tell myself, oh, who I am isn't good enough. I have to be this character, but who I actually am is wrong. And right. so really counterintuitively, the more successful you get not being aligned, actually, it becomes even harder to become aligned because now the public knows you one way and how are you going to come out as who you actually are? And so I think, you know, 
the same issues every human faces, no matter if we have tons of money, tons of fame or not, we're all struggling with the same stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like too, just even, so even going back about 25 years or so, where I had this intuition to start stand up comedy, yeah. right? And I actually had three people in one day tell me, you should be doing stand up. So I took it as a sign from the universe or whoever, mm -hmm. as in like, oh, you should be doing that. But three people in one day, yeah. I was like, oh gosh, I better do yeah. something. Mm -hmm. So I do that. And then I think, okay, because if we've been programmed that it's hard to make money, it's hard to be yeah. successful. And then also have this almost wall put up because you're scared of losing your authenticity, yeah. right? Because, or, or if people, if you're programmed that rich people are a-holes or, mm -hmm. you know, rich people are fill in the blank, then I'm going to self-sabotage yes. and not be rich because I don't want you to think I'm fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I see a so, lot of that happen with people. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's amazing that you, it, it, you would you say, um, if, with people having to open up that quick to you within that two and a half hours, do you find that sometimes it's just harder to get in there or do you just kind of get in there and like blow the friendship right open? <laughs> yeah. I mean, hopefully I blow the friendship right open. You know, I do get people who are resistant, you know, it, you know, especially one-on-one, -on -one, it can be a little bit more of a price point. So I think it's something that people think about and they usually want to try to open up or invest in a little bit. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think, what I'll say is everything that we think is wrong about us or bad about us is our secret superpower. And I know that sounds trite. I know we hear that a lot, but like growing up, I was the type of person I'm at a party in high school and I am like in the corner 2am zeroed in on someone having like intense crying conversation. Like that is just me. And so I have always been bad at small talk. And I feel like that you're know, learning how to channel that into my career, into my success has been one of the greatest gifts of my life. And realizing that like, my ability to have people tell me about their trauma or assault within minutes of meeting me is mm -hmm. what makes me really successful at what I do. And so definitely there are times where people are resistant. And what I'll say is in my work, I take radical responsibility. So if someone doesn't feel safe, that's my fault. And that's my problem in that environment. And so I will do whatever I can to make sure it's a really, really safe place where people aren't judged. They can talk about whatever they want. Um, they don't feel like they have to figure out what I'm looking for. I think a lot of people try to give me what they think I want. And what I always tell them is I ask you a question, don't even answer the question. I don't care what you say. I'm really good at what I do and I will get the answers I need. So you just talk and I'll right. make sure we get what we need out of this. Yes. I love that too, because it's, it's not only using your words, it's your body language. It's your yeah. energy that you're bringing to it. And the, the literal sacred space that you're holding for that person to know, like we're in this together. Like yeah. I'm here to work for you and we're here to get this out of you. Yeah. Right. So you have to literally like fish that on out of there. Yeah. I You're also, just asking people to talk about themselves, which exactly. who doesn't like talking about yourself. Right. right. And, and I know people more don't about realize that than almost anything. Their things are getting mapped. I mean, they don't have to think. They just tell stories. And I'm kind of mapping these patterns in front of them without them realizing it. And so it's really, really fun and easy for me because then once I've mapped these patterns, what I'm going to do is use their language and figure out how they relate to language. So for example, I'll say, you know, if you are real, are you automatically authentic? And if they say yes, I can stop packaging uh, in. That's why we call it mapping sensitivities. Because what I'm mm -hmm. doing is just mapping in their own words how they would describe every one of their experiences. So we can get down to five or six words that explain everything they've ever felt. And that's what we were. I don't care if your words are Sally, Bob, and Jim. It doesn't phase my life. And that's why I tell people, like, I don't really care about this. You're the one who has to live your life, not me. Right. I'm just here to be kind of a silent witness. And so it's really fun because I just get like a, a little bird's eye view into people's, the way that they would describe their life. Yeah. 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 I feel like my map would be like a three-year-old scribbling. Like that's, that's what I feel like. <laughs> beautiful. That's what we want, right? We need that. So I think it's just so fun to get to, um, you know, I don't think enough people, we get this opportunity. Like I think people will do personality tests and that's awesome, but it's like one out of 16 types in someone else's words. Like that's, cool, but that's going to be inherently limiting, right? Yes. When we start describing our own sensitivities, then we're like, oh, this is why that felt traumatic. This is why that felt good over here. You know, this is why this was successful over here. And I, I don't even have to know what these words mean to you, but they're about what they mean to you. Right. Yes.
so important. And that's important too. So I do coaching yeah. in, you know, being authentic and exactly that, using their words. And you don't ever want to change their words because then it doesn't have any meaning to them. Right. So if I'm feeding you information, that's no good because it's not going to sit with you or it's not, that's you're right. not going to hear it the right way or see it or feel it. That's so right. yeah, I love that. Papa's remains. Capone's vault. Area 51. All mysteries have the same thing in common. The missing piece. The missing piece. Hello, I'm Nathaniel Westman, here to tell you about a fascinating new series coming soon to so much energy. Moving picture, picture theater. theater. Art in its most pure form. Color. So join me, Nathaniel Westman, curator of this innovative series, Moving Picture Theater, Theater. where together we take a deep dive into the maelstrom of the heart and soul of film. See you then. Cinema. Raw. With me, Nathaniel Westman, on behalf of So Much Genergy. So Much Genergy. So much energy. Film every. Yeah. So I have, I have, I don't know if we can get into this. We have the time. I have like yeah. the most epic engagement story that you've ever okay. heard in your entire yeah. life. And it's pretty like, it's <laughs> of no intention of my own, but it is such an engagement story that I feel like if we have a few minutes, I want okay. to share this story yeah. with you. Oh yeah. So, yeah. all right. So this story starts basically, you know, I knew I wanted to propose to my husband about six months into our relationship. Now we okay. still hadn't figured out the intimacy, but I knew I wanted to propose. And the reason was I was at a party. I had just started getting better and it was a Christmas party. And it was the first time I went out and saw people. And so Garrett was working at a hospital at the time. He was on residency and he had to work till midnight. So I went to this party by myself and I'm at this party and there's a snowstorm. And this party is in the worst section of Boston where you cannot park. Like it's cobblestone streets. Nobody can park over here. And I'm in the middle of this party. It's about midnight or maybe 1230 now. And I look over and Garrett is sitting in the corner in his scrubs. I'm kind of like, what are you doing here? Like, why would you come to this party? And he said, well, you know what? I've been working for like 16 hours today. And I was, you know, in my scrubs and I was about to go home. And I realized that if I went home, I wouldn't see you for a half hour because you take public transportation home and I wouldn't get to see you. And I also just wanted on this, after this really long day of work to come and sit in the corner and just watch you tell stories because I could watch you tell stories endlessly. And so I'm sitting here having a drink and just watching you. And that's all I wanted tonight. And I thought, shit, I need to marry this person. <laughs> And so I, I had this plan. I had this plan to propose on this balcony and the Amalfi Coast in Italy, overlooking the Mediterranean. And I thought, I'm not going to pull this off. Like, I'm just starting my own business. I can't hide, you know, $10,000 and not be stressed out about money, right? Like, I can't right. surprise him with this. Yeah. So it took, it took me four years. But four years later, I, you know, said to him, hey, Garrett, why don't you take a week off of work, like, in four months? And he's kind of like, okay. And it's like, oh, we're not going anywhere far. It's just like a little, little thing. And I really wanted to um, get his parents' blessing. And so I pretended I was going to a yoga retreat in Syracuse, but secretly flew down to Philly. Um, I stayed with his ex-girlfriend because she was an important part of his life. I wanted to include her too. She drove me to their um, parents' uh, house. It was a very, very weird weekend. I wish I could get into it. I'll probably get in trouble. But it was a bizarre weekend. I, I like Hanging out with my in-laws without him was more bizarre than I could ever say. So anyway... <laughs> I was so desperate to tell him this, but I couldn't because it was a surprise engagement. So I was like, right. So I, I fly back and he, I knew he was going to check flight tracker. And I was like, oh crap. Like he's going to know I'm not on the plane I say I'm on. So I'm like, I don't know what you mean. I'm not in the air. Flight tracker must not be working. Don't, I kept, I tried every lie. I was like, I have Uber credit. Don't pick me up. I was, I mean, I was trying everything to try to. So anyway, somehow I lied my way out of that. <laughs> So now we get to the day Great when we're going to start the relationship. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. To the marriage. So <laughs> we, it, it, all based on lies. It's the right. perfect thing. I, I'm a great liar, by the yeah. way. I'm an it's excellent for, liar. It's for the greater good. Yes. Ex I think, yeah. Lying for the greater good is important, actually. It's a really good skill set to have. And so we get to the day when I'm, you know, going to propose or I'm going to, we're going to get to Italy. And he has been asking me nonstop, are we flying or driving? And I was kind of like, listen. 
pack for both. I wouldn't put a knife in your carry on, but pack for both. <laughs> and he said, you know, are we going far? And, I, and unfortunately, that week in Italy it was going to be a little cooler. I was like, nope, pack like you would be around here. We're not going too far. And so the one thing he said to me is, okay, now will I need my passport? Because here's the thing. Nobody ever needs their passport. And everyday life, if you don't think. Garrett decided to start teaching at a university and needed his passport for tax reasons that very day. And I was like, are you kidding me? You're going to have your passport on you. And so I said, all right, Mike, you just got to make a decision here. And I was like, no, you know what? You, I don't want you to lose it and bring it. We're not going international. You don't need your passport. And so I said, why don't you go pack the car and I'll be down in a second. I have to pee. He went to put the passport away. I sprinted in the bad bedroom after him, zipping it up as he's coming up the stairs. My heart is pounding. I've got the passport. So I was like, oh, not that car. I mean, the Uber I just ordered. So we get into the Uber and, you know, you can put in the address you're going to without telling the driver. So I was trying to be smooth and, you know, okay. he wouldn't know we were going to the airport. Now, here's where I get psychotic, if you can't tell. <laughs> I study the blueprint of the airport. So I know if you get dropped off at Terminal E in Boston, that's international. I can't have that. He's going to know we're going international. I get, get dropped off at C because there's a passageway from C to E. I'm studying this blueprint. And C is JetBlue. We fly JetBlue a lot. So I thought this is believable. Also, so please get hold off at one, C. one hot second. So because you're used to mapping anyway. So you're like, it's I'm mapping anyway, map. right? So this is my mind. <laughs> this is my mind. You know, it knows the map. That is right. right. So, so we get over there. We, we get okay. to the, the kiosk and yeah. I was like, oh shit, shit, shit. And he's like, what is it? What'd you forget? And I was like, um, um, can you just hold this? And I give him his passport. He's like, what? Like, this is my, your passport. Why would you bring it? Wait, it's my passport. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hold this? And I give him three books on Rome. He's like, what's going on here? So when you get up tomorrow morning, you'll be in Rome, I'm getting on a plane to Rome tonight. He's like, what are you talking about? I said, come on, we're going to walk through our passageway. And so Garrett's mom is, you know, God bless her, the worst liar out there. Oh. Not like me. She's a terrible liar. <laughs> and I said to her, listen, Cheryl, Cheryl, this is going to be a tough one, right? Cheryl? I need you. This is a two-part lie. Y yeah, you got to pretend. He's going to call you at the airport. You have to pretend you knew we were going to Italy, but not that we're getting engaged. So there are like layers to this lie. You've okay. got to be able to handle this one. Yes. <laughs> Somehow she does it. I'm very proud of her. Okay, so we job, get on that Cheryl. plane. A good job, Cheryl. And I said to him, Garrett, we can do the local thing. I've lived in Italy. We can do the local thing. We can do the touristy thing. This is your trip. We're going to be half the week in Rome, half the week in Amalfi. Otherwise, you do you. You've got this whole plan, plan ride to plan it. So we get to Italy and we have a great time. And it is supposed to rain every single day there. But it doesn't. It is beautiful. And I think, oh, thank God someone's looking out for me. <laughs> Amazing. So we're having a great day in Italy, a great weekend in Italy. And it finally it comes to the day when we're supposed to leave for the Amalfi Coast. We had a 2 p.m. train. It was the last train of the day. And Garrett said, all right, before we leave Rome, I want to go to the Vatican. And I thought on a Saturday, great, this is going to be a disaster. It's going to be so busy. But OK, let's try this thing, right? So we get over to the Vatican. Finally, finally, it's not supposed to rain. The one beautiful day, we are so happy. We're not lugging our raincoats and our umbrellas anymore. And we get over to the Vatican and we get in line and someone tells me it's about a two hour wait. And I'm like, no, you know, they are so overdramatic. They just try to scare you out of line. Don't worry about it. Let's just get in line. <laughs> we get in line, it starts downpouring. Now we do not have umbrellas. We do not have ponchos. We have nothing. It is downpouring and I have to pee now. And I'm sitting in this torrential downpour. I can't get out of line because I don't want to lose my spot. And I have to pee so badly. Yeah. And we're waiting and we're waiting. And now Garrett starts to get hungry. And we're waiting and we're waiting some more. And we had to buy a 10 euro poncho just to wrap around his camera because it is getting soaked. It's an expensive camera. Like it was a disaster. So finally, it has been two and a half hours. We are three people from the front of the line. And Garrett says, I don't want to spend like 40 euro to go in for 10 minutes. Let's just get out of line now. So we get out of line after two and a half hours of standing outside in the rain. So all I want to do at this point is pee. Like I just have to pee. I mean, I am, can't sit still. And Garrett is hungry. And so I'm running around to every restaurant begging them to let us in. But it's 1245. Nothing is opening until one. And the, I'm like, fine. I don't even care about food. I just want to pee. Please let me pee. And nobody's letting me pee. 
And now we're in the middle of Rome. There is no alley I can just go pee in. So yeah. I am like, all right, I, we, just get back to the hotel. I just got to pee there. So I go over to the metro station and there were people standing outside in the rain. And I was like, what is going on here? So I asked them in Italian, like, what's happening? And they said, oh, there's a delay between these three stops. The only stops we needed. I thought, oh my God, we are walking Boy. home now. We are it's power walking home. We've just got to get home at this point. And so we're over there. And again, my map, I pull out this map that is now disintegrating in the rain. Yes. And I'm trying to read street signs that are etched into building in Roman letters and is downpouring so hard I can't see them. Long story short, the bridge we wanted went one way. The bridge we took went a complete different way. We are now further from our hotel in Rome. <laughs> I have to pee so bad. Garrett's hunger has turned to hangry. He is now hangry in the streets. I am, we stop bickering and I just think F this. I am not proposing today. I have spent years planning. I have spent thousands of dollars. This is not the day. Like I am right. waiting another day. I'm so upset because the first time Garrett, he'd never been to Europe. I wanted the first time him to see the Mediterranean was when I proposed and this just wasn't going to happen. And so I'm just like, I can't even sit still at this point. And I remember before I left, I didn't remember at the time, but before I left, a friend who's Hindu said to me, Mike, I think you should pray to the Hindu god Ganesha. It's the elephant like God, mm -hmm. um, because it's the placer and remover of obstacles, you know, the guardian of thresholds, and this feels important. So I thought, okay, whatever. I did a prayer that she sent me. Okay. Forgot all about it. We're now in the middle of Rome. We are bickering. And I look up and the entire side of a building is painted with a mural of Ganesha. And I think, okay obstacles for a reason pay attention there's something going on here right right so i'm trying my best to not be freaking out and you know i remember this piazza garrett remembers that piazza long story short we find our way back to the hotel <laughs> we get back to the hotel we run in just to pee and grab a power bar at this point and we sprint over to the metro station so we get into the metro station and we bought these weekly passes you know so i put mine through i go through the turnstile garrett goes to put his through and says oh shit it was in my front pocket. It's now disintegrated from the rain. Uh -huh. I don't have a pass. So I'm saying, oh my God, I can't come back through. It won't let me back through. And I have to now yell to you how to go <laughs> to the machine, you know, translate from Italian to English, get your new ticket. It's a busy Roman train station in on a Saturday. You're an American. Nobody's helping you. Like I am trying to scream this across the turnstile. So he goes through, he finally figures it out, puts it in. It doesn't work. I'm like, we have like one more shot at this. We are not catching this train. So he puts it in, it finally works. So we take the metro over to Roma Damini, which is the main train station in Italy. So this has got like 40 trains going at any given time. I mean, this is a busy train station, the main one in Italy. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my God. So we get there and we've got five minutes till the train leaves. I'm like, thank God we made it. Okay. I run off to make sure what I printed out offline was okay if I had to exchange it for a physical ticket. And I said, Garrett, this is where it'll be posted. You just look for a track number. So I come back, there's two minutes until our train leaves and there's no track number posted. And I said, Garrett, if we miss this train, we A, have nowhere to play, stay in Rome. We are losing our non-refundable place down there. We're losing this ticket. It's like a thousand dollars. We can't afford to miss this train. It's the last train of the day. Yeah. So I said, we're going through security and we are run up in, running up and down all 40 trains and we are finding that freaking train. And so we go through security. We run up and down all 40 trains. We cannot find our train. We are freaking out now. We know it's less than two minutes, right? So I run over to an attendant. I'm like, hey, just call. And he's like, no, I think you're confused. As I am not confused. Please, please, please call this in. He goes to call this in. And he says, oh my God, your train is leaving le in less than a minute. Run. We now have every bag we have brought to Italy. We are sweaty and disgusting. And we are sprinting down this platform. I swear to God, I wish I were lying or exaggerating this. It was like a scene from a movie. We jumped onto the train and within 10 seconds, the train took off. Ooh. So I am now sweating. I am exhausted. <laughs> I am hungry and angry. And my only thought is screw this. I am not proposing today. <laughs> and Garrett turns to me and said, you know, it's so weird for everything that went wrong. You would have thought we would have turned on each other, but we didn't. We worked together as a team. Isn't that weird? And I thought, shit, now I have to propose today. So, you know, we take this train ride, it's three hours long. Um, I put his, I got him a watch. I put it into my raincoat because God knows it's still raining. We walk a mile from the train station, still in the rain. But at this point, I am determined. Like it is just happening at this point. We check into the hotel 
and we get our bags and we put it in. And I say, hey, Garrett, do you want to go check out the rooftop? Who in their right mind would want to check out the rooftop in this rainstorm? But Garrett's like, I, I guess, okay. <laughs> so we get out to this rooftop. Right now it's just drizzling at this point, but still not very pleasant. Yeah. And I say, hey, why don't you go check out that castle in the distance that you obviously can't see through the fog? <laughs> and so he goes and turns around to look at this castle. And I get down on one knee. And at this point, I'm like, screw it. I've got no plan. Like everything's shot to shit. I am just right. winging this at this point. Right. So he turns back around, down on one knee. And I said, Garrett, I won't lie to you. I woke up this morning and I planned on proposing. And then everything went to shit. Literally everything that could have went wrong, went wrong. And I just thought, screw this. I'm not proposing to you. Like I've got one shot at this. I have planned for months at this. I have spent so much money. I did all these like sneaky things behind your back. I'm a great liar, as we know. And like, I come on, I have one shot at this and I'm not wasting it today. And then we started working together as a team. And I realized I don't just have one shot at this. I have a million shots at this because every day for the rest of my life, I'm just waking up. I'm asking myself, am I still game to do this? And I'm asking you to love me. Today is just one of those days. Yeah. So I brought you to the most beautiful place that I know that could potentially rival your beauty to ask you, will you marry me? And he said, maybe. No, he said, oh, yes. I was like, what? <laughs> no, he said, yes. He said, yes. And then I, I pulled out of my pocket a, a time stamped picture of me and his mom that said Cheryl approved across it. And I told him that, you know, I went down there and asked for their blessing. And I got to tell him all the weird stories that happened. I, I was just waiting. So that was my favorite part of the engagement, actually. Nice. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, congratulations. And this entire time I wanted to know is why didn't you just pee your pants? Oh like, yeah, no, I should have. Like You're you should right. have just peed and nobody would have even known. I mean, I felt like it was a bad look on the day I was getting engaged, but you know <laughs> what? You're, you're absolutely right. So, you know, missed up. That was definitely just like your didn't get into porn editing. This was my big regret in life. Yep. Sometimes you just gotta let it ride. That's right. <laughs> oh my gosh. And you've been married how long? So we've been married for about three and a half years now. Okay, fun. That's so amazing. That's awesome. And do you still, every day, do you just wake up best friends and love and life? Let's say that. Yeah, no, I actually, <laughs> I, I, I do think, I, I will say, I think that our, you know, the COVID has been, you know, hard for some people. For us, I feel like we already hang out a lot. It's been a little bit harder because Garrett's doing some televisits. So we're coexisting at work. That's not something we're used to. Okay. But no, I think I, I feel really blessed. I feel like, you know, my therapist is like, oh my God, you guys had a fight. This is great. Like, I want to talk about it because it almost never happens. So yeah. she's always really excited. So yeah, I do feel like we have a pretty, pretty amicable relationship. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow is uh, 420. And mm -hmm. it's our anniversary. We've been married for 25 years. No, oh, congratulations. Yeah, Jeez. good times. <laughs> Still like each other. <laughs> and it's 420, so that's Jeff Jones' favorite day. Perfect. There you go. <laughs> Jen, I'm not bragging, but it also falls on Taco Tuesday. Mm, well, this is like, I mean, that's like a auspicious date. I and mean, this year, that is a big thing. <laughs> Right. Oh, man. So I do have another question for you, Mike. Shoot. Anything. When you were in the middle of your illness, yeah. was this and, you, and not asking for like a diagnosis, just wondering if it was actually like stress related from work? Like, did you just work yourself? Yeah. Up so, and I, you know, they think so. So, yeah, I, I've been diagnosed with a bunch of things. Um, basically, it's like something autoimmune. But, you know, based on levels, I've gotten a few different diagnoses over the years. And it's definitely, you know, I, I'm dairy free, gluten free, I have to do a whole a few things to keep my health up these days. But um, yeah, definitely stress was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think not feeling really aligned in my life, a lot of things that I was probably suppressing and not even realizing I was. Yeah. I, I really teach that too, in, um, just laughing, you know, like yeah. getting that out of your body yes. and yeah. no matter, even if it's just fake laughing. So I do <laughs> laughing meditation mm -hmm. and, you know, people are like, that's ridiculous. And I'm like, is it though? Because that's exactly right? what dis ease is. Mm -hmm. like, Absolutely. Yeah. Not at ease. Hello. Mm -hmm. And then they're always like, Oh, well, you're so healthy. And like, everything. <laughs> right. Hello. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Well, where can people find you? 
Yep. So you can go to my website, just mikeimle.com. If anyone's like, oh, this idea of sacred branding or mapping sensitivity is cool, um, we have a free training. So you can just download a worksheet and actually start mapping your own sensitivities. And you can just go to mikeimle.com slash map, M-A-P. And it's free. So go check it out. Nice. And it's Mike. Can you spell your last name I for everybody? I can spell it for you. We it's have uh, audio listeners and then we have video listeners. All right. So yes, it is M I K E. And then I A M E L E dot com. Okay, perfect. Yeah. That's so awesome that you offer the free mapping too. Yeah, absolutely. So I will be honest with you. I'm good. I'm not that good. So in 36 minutes, I can't do two and a half hours worth, but it will right. get you started and it will help you to really understand what these sensitivities are. Yeah, but I think just getting people to take that first step. Exactly. You know I mean, a lot of people are scared, like, oh, I don't know, I even know where to start. Exactly, exactly. And you can start yeah. to realize, you know, oh, there are patterns in my life. And that's really what we want to get you to once you start realizing that. And then, of course, we can go deeper and actually figuring those out definitively. Yeah. And I feel like you're really just putting the P in the MAP for the map. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. That, and that's me. That's That should be my new motto in life. So I think that that's beautiful. Right. Well, it's been super fun. Jeff Jones, did you have any other questions for Mike? Uh, no. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks, Mike. It was so much fun. I love all your fun stories. I'm excited that everything's turned out amazing. And we wish you much success. And look forward to just hearing how awesome you're doing. In your yeah, MAP. Thanks. That's right. <laughs> thanks for having me. Okay, we'll see you again. All right, Jeffy. Good times with Mike. Oh man, nice. I like that guy. Good stories. Yeah, great that stories. That was an emotional roller coaster. I hear Woo. you there. <laughs> and we got oh, the clip look. notes version of his uh, engagement. <laughs> I like Good it. Good for them too, though. Good for them too. Yeah, no, it's always yeah. great when people are happy and you know. Oh yeah, that guy's straight fire. Yeah. <laughs> I am Ellie, fighter, mapping his way nice. through life. Good times with that nugget. So you got some pep in your step this week. Jen, you know I do. Um, I would listened to a podcast a while back, and they had spoke about, they were talking on there about an article the lady on the podcast was talking about that she had read, which was about revenge, bedtime, procrastination. Well, Revenge? Skin, revenge, bedtime, bedtime, procrastination. Okay. It's a weird name. I believe that's what it translates from the Chinese name. Okay. I, I'm it. I believe it translated over to revenge, bedtime, procrastination. Okay. And the, what it is, is basically you can't lay in bed right before you go to sleep, checking social media oh, was the yeah. gist. Yeah. Also, they talked about, you can't, you shouldn't be reading. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. You shouldn't be reading. You shouldn't be checking social media. You shouldn't be watching anything new or old. They were specific about that. Like, don't be watching anything that you haven't seen yet, but definitely don't be watching stuff that you've already seen. Because even once you turn it off, your mind is still going to be playing it all out in your mind when you're trying to go to sleep. Oh, that's what it was about was basically how to, it, how to get yourself to sleep easier, have a better night's sleep. Okay. But what they had broken it down to was the last hour of your day, Spend 20 minutes tying up the last 20 minutes or the first 20 minutes of that last hour of your day. Mm -hmm. Spend 20 minutes tying up loose ends. Maybe if you need to, responding to emails only if necessary, returning phone calls, things like that. 20 okay. minutes. Another 20 minutes on your hygiene, maybe a hot shower, hot bath, something that's going to physically relax you. Okay. Then the last 20 minutes, just spend it relaxing, journaling, mm -hmm. maybe praying. But definitely not checking social media, yeah. not getting invested into a book, not getting invested into the news. Yeah. They, it was real big. The news was a downer. Don't be watching that before bed. Right. Because that's either going to just add more anxiety to you, more that, stuff to keep your mind racing. Yeah. That's actually why we don't have a TV in our bedroom. We've never had a TV in our bedroom because... Um, you know, even being at grandma's at Graham's when, she, you know, she'd fall asleep on the couch with the TV all the time. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. and what I did like about going over there is waking up and the TV would be on. That's when I get to catch kid bits, little yeah. rascals, three. Right. <laughs> no, 
know, it was cool. But at the same time, I always wonder about that. Like in the middle of the night, what's being programmed into people, especially, you know, like, and I'm talking like, so when you wake up and there was a two hour infomercial on and you're like, I need to buy a copper pot, you know, because you don't know why, because they subliminally put it in there that you need this copper pot. Yep. Or you just wake up to the bars. Remember that when the TV would go off the air, they'd play the, was the star spangled banner? Yeah, at the midnight. Yeah, where the flag would wave, yeah. and that's the last thing. And then the TV was going off the air, and then just boop with the color Stand bars. By. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Nice. But, yeah. Yeah. Reading that article, and I've been trying to put that in the practice. It's only been three days, three nights now that I've done it, but I have stuck to it. Yeah. Do, do yep. you find you're, you're sleeping better? I think so. Yeah. I believe so, but I'm I'm also hoping that it'll get better over time as you, you know yeah. what I mean I, I will say this I'm falling asleep a lot quicker okay. I will say that yeah so there's actually studies done too in that you shouldn't grab your phone the very first thing in the morning either because of the the light in it actually will penetrate into your mind and it'll wake it up too fast instead of like slowly like you should be progressively waking up you know yep. and like you know when you get up and you're like okay, do, 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 go to the bathroom and then start doing stuff. But if you grab your phone, it like is an electric charge right into your brain saying like, oh, and then it goes right into fight or flight. So when you're stressed out already first thing in the morning, check your routine for sure. Yep. Yeah. Because yeah. what I started doing is I journal first thing in the morning. It, so when we're Josh gets ready and then I'm journaling and then when he leaves, I I do meditation after that. And then I start my day and I find that if I, don't do that. The day is stressful. I don't know. It's, right. it's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So revenge, bedtime, procrastination. Okay. Yeah. I like it. Yep. Glad you mentioned Anything that. putting pep in your step? Yeah. So this Saturday, so from when the show comes out, this Saturday, May 1st, I'm doing my first monthly meetup and comedy show that's going to be um, before I did it as one. And now I'm going to actually split it up. So people will have the option to come to the mind shift. <laughs> I said it again on the radio show this morning. I had a radio interview and said mind shift without the F again. So I don't know why that just keeps. They yell at you. No, no. Cause I think it was an online uh, radio show. So the host had been swearing the whole time. So oh, they're like, Whoa, we're popular in kindergartners. Hell yeah. <laughs> And so, um, yeah, so we're going to do a mind shift at 7.30. So free training from 7.30 to 8.30. And then the comedy show from 9 to like 9.45-ish. All right. Yeah, All so nice. I'm super excited about that. Yeah, good times. Good times. Good That's deal. here in Johnson City, at Tennessee at the Doubletree Hotel. Nice. Yeah, they have a restaurant there called the Burger Bar that you get to like check off, like you, it's a menu. And then you just check off all the items you want on your own. It's like build a burger. God, that'd be great. God bless. I feel like a knob every time I got to stress, like plain, but just cheese, nothing on it. So yeah. you don't want cheese? Yes, with cheese, but nothing else on it. Right. So no meat I just bun. want meat. I want two buns and meat and cheese. That's it. Like, do yep. you need a visual? Yeah, I know. That's nice. all. The, but then they have these sweet potato fries that have this, dip it's called maple mayo which sounds totally disgusting except it's almost like a melted werther's in like oh it's magic it's magical i don't know why pretty sure there's into this there's i'm pretty sure there's drugs in it (laughs) (laughs) i did ask him i did ask our little buddy there julia little julia at the burger bar she's super cool nice she sounds amazing yeah She's great. She wears fun bandanas. So we're little bandana buddies. Oh, no doubt. Tell her I said hi. Yeah, I will. I left her a little review on Yelp. Yelp! (laughs) (laughs) Yelp! Jeffrey, well, good to see you again this week. And we'll be back again next week. So we We will will see you then. (laughs) 